would not want to get too far without doing that. All right, so we'll record this, we'll post it in the course, and then we'll also um, share it on the Student Affairs Assessment Listserv's YouTube page for folks who may miss it. But hello, everybody, and welcome to our semi end of course live session. Uh, this is the, you know, the, the eighth week of from the course start, but in light of COVID-19, we extended the course end out to May 10th. So it's not quite the 10th week uh, or the, the end of the course, but for folks who you know started the course and have been going a week at a time, a, mod a module per week, like the instructors, um, this was the originally scheduled end of the course. Um, I'm joined here by, well, well you're, you're joined with our, uh, the instructors for the course. Uh, my name is Joe Levy. I'm the Executive Director of Assessment and Accre Accreditation at National Lewis University in Chicago, Illinois, uh, and one of your instructors. We also have, take it away, Emily. Oh, I was waiting for Ben to go because his name is listed. <laughs> I'm Emily Langdon, and I am um, one of the instructors as well and I am the assessment coordinator at the University of California Merced campus. And I also teach uh, in, in our management program. I'm actually teaching a uh, class in teamwork that was very experiential and now is an online class. So I am glad that I have been doing the MOOC with Ben and Joe for a while. It has taught me a lot about uh, using Canvas and doing things online because it is coming into um, it's come, coming very handy as we finish off this semester remotely. And I am Ben Andrews, uh, another one of your instructors. I'm a part-time faculty member in the Sociology and Criminal Justice Department at Seattle Pacific University. Um, and so we are just kind of getting started online uh, for our spring quarter here. And so kind of making that transition as well. But happy to be here with you all. All right. Ooh, and I love that we already have a question. <laughs> this is awesome. Keep these up. Um, so let me, uh, Melissa, we will get to your question shortly. Um, let me just share what we're hoping to accomplish today. Uh, do a quick little check-in, give some preliminary numbers on how the course is looking in terms of um, numbers of students as well as uh, people who've already completed. No pressure there, just, just want, to, want to share and make sure folks are aware. Um, we'll do some module reflections. Uh, and so that's where we might um, try to tackle your question a little bit, because uh, it might fall nicely with, with some of our modules here. Uh, and then talk a little about using the course as a professional development opportunity and invite you all to, to share from, from your perspective what it's, what it's been like, and then have some wrap up. All right, so. Okay, so I think the first thing we want to do is basically just say thanks for being here, check in, see how everybody's doing. Uh, we know these are uh, kind of wild times and so uh, we've been really kind of blown away by the uh, participation that everybody's still done throughout all of these changes. I think certainly one of the advantages of having an online course is the consistency we were able to have during this time, uh, but really just Thanks for being here. Uh, we're excited to be talking with you amidst um, kind of a continually changing time. Uh, Joe, did you want to open it up to see how folks were doing in general? Yeah, I mean, people are free to chat in or um, if, if you want to vocalize uh, anything, um, you're welcome to. I think, you know, this has been something I've been doing for all of my meetings recently in terms of just a quick level set in case, um, you know, we, we do have a lot of people that maybe are dealing with a lot and they're here, but they maybe aren't 100% here and, and that's totally okay. And it's just, it can be helpful for, for us to know kind of your mental bandwidth and, and kind of what you're bringing to, to the opportunity um, while we're here and, and that um, we support you either way. And, and um, you know, you don't have to actively participate. You can just uh, listen and, um, but, wanted to at least create some space so folks are free to chat that in and um, or if you're thinking about what you might want to say we can also uh, talk a little bit about how we're feeling 
I'll just I'll just start. Can people hear me? I oh you get how are we? <laughs> That's how we are. Um, <laughs> it's on fire. <laughs> I just put under the check in. I thought this would be a good time to just issue a general apology <laughs> to say um, that you know I started um, with the whole team in in module one, and then I had module two as the um, lead instructor, and I kind of check out and I watch module two for a while and then I check back in at module seven and it, um, it, it, the world changed right between my module two and my module seven, like this guy with the picture of his thing exploding, that's what happened. So I just feel like, I uh, feel um, much, it's much harder to engage online. Normally doing the MOOC is a treat for me because I get to go online and see. And now you're probably doing the same thing I'm doing. All of my meetings are online. All, all of my cl classes are online. So it's it's been a little disorienting. Um, and I also just wanna take this opportunity to say that I have a LinkedIn profile that I never use. Like I made it uh, years ago because I had to have one to do actually an assessment project I was involved in. And so people during this time come to my LinkedIn and wanna link in with me, but I don't use it. So I'm just gonna apologize now. If you're trying to get in touch with me via LinkedIn, I don't use it. So find another way. <laughs> if you really need to reach me, email me or something. Um, I notice my LinkedIn thing goes up every time we do this MOOC and I'm afraid that I don't even know my password anymore. So that's my check-in. <laughs> Thanks, team. Hi all, this is Anne Marie um, and I'm in Omaha, Nebraska. And one thing that I see a lot, um, both with personal and professional connections is the, um, the cycling of emotions tend to see like, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, I can hold it together for a couple days. And then there's like a day when meltdowns just happen. And then, you know, a glass of wine later, a cup of coffee later, you kind of suck it up. And then, okay, 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 for a couple days. And then there's another day that's bad. And so I see a lot more cycling now lately than I have ever in the past when there's um, times of stress and distress. Thanks for sharing, Ann. I would say I relate to that of, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of probably many who are working from home and uh, my partner is also working from home and we have a three-year-old and a nine-month-old. Uh, so we have a full house here and, um, and yeah, we have good days and, and maybe we'll have a, a stretch of a couple good days where we feel like we're getting in a good rhythm and then uh, feel like the, you know, for one of us, our, our world will get um, turned upside down or uh, yeah, just things will, that perspective will dramatically shift for one reason or another. And um, I think in that cycling, it's important for, for everyone to find, you know, ways to take care of themselves and, and ways to, um, you know, center yourself and, and try and as much as you can um, level things out uh, when when they are at the extremes um, and to really give yourselves and others grace uh, as much as possible at this time. You know, it's one of the things, you know, um, I don't even think anyone reached out. Uh, it's just given our campus was doing everything for uh, accommodating the the virus that my first thought is okay so I need to talk to Canvas and we need to extend this course um, just to make sure that that happens and that that's not a concern for anybody um, and so hopefully folks have been able to appreciate and not stress about the course at all um, you know with, with everything going on but it's been also really great to see people um, you know, sign up still and, and really throw themselves into the course. Sure, and, and I guess that's a good transition to Joe for like extension, uh, course extension here. Uh, also, before I get to that, thanks for everybody who's chatting in. Um, sounds like there's still been a lot of great engagement during this time too, and we really appreciate your flexibility during this time as well. Um, so the, as Joe mentioned, the course has now been extended to May 10th. Um, it's gonna look a little bit different for us as instructors. Uh, because we have been following kind of the week by week process. Uh, and so we're going to be engaging with the discussion boards that we've been assigned to maybe a little bit more sporadically from now until the 10th, but you do have that extension 
to um, be able to still utilize the course and uh, complete those quizzes and everything in that process. Okay, so um, folks can feel free to keep um, chatting in comments and, and how things are going. Um, I want to, and, and we'll, trust me, we'll have plenty of time for feedback within the modules and, and at the end for a QA. and a um, So don't worry about that, but uh, I do want to keep things moving along. Um, I'm very excited to share about our course numbers. Uh, we, so final enrollment, which um, has been interesting because there have been some people who have, I guess, dropped the course, uh, which I always tell people there's no sense in dropping the course because you, one, you didn't pay for it. Two, it's not like it's going on, I don't know, your Canvas transcript. Uh, so, so there's no penalty in, in staying in. And if you drop the course, you can't re-log back in and you lose access to all the materials. So it, so if any of you are, are listening to this and you feel like you're not gonna be able to finish by May 10th, that's fine. You know, we as instructors, our feelings will not be hurt if you do not finish. You know, our, all, that, all that matters, all that does to us is it just impacts our course completion numbers, which are already really great for a MOOC. <laughs> so there's no pressure on you to feel like you have to remove your, physically remove yourself from the course roster if you can't finish. Um, you know, I tell people all the time, even if you don't think you can even engage in the course, if you think it's gonna be helpful, sign up because you maintain access to it well after it's over. And so we'd rather have you sign up for it to have that access so that it's helpful at some point than not sign up at all. Um, but that being said, we have, uh, oddly enough, 2019 students um, here in 2020. And uh, just in terms of perspective, when we first ran the course, we had over 2,500 students. It was wildly popular, and it's been pretty popular since then. But the last two years, we were in the 1,200, um, 1,300 range. So huge surge of um, numbers this term. And in fairness, while we have gotten a good bump um, from especially the extension and, and people um, hearing more about the course, we did have a good uh, – we had over a thousand before the course started and we had close to 1500 even um, near the start of the course. So it, it's been a pretty strong showing this term in general, uh, which is just a good testament to past people who've taken the course and spread word about it because we hear a lot of people that that's how they hear about it is people who took it before recommend it to them. Um, and while the course is not over by any means, I mean, people still have until May 10th, uh, we do already have 348 people who have um, completed the course and to define completion, uh, I mean that they have uh, passed all the quizzes and earned the, the statement of accomplishment and the badge for the course. Um, there's probably plenty of people who have also gone through the course and maybe didn't earn that and, and that's just a little harder for us to, to quantify and measure. Um, but uh, to put it in perspective, you know, 348 out of two, 2019, that's 17% uh, completion rate, which is great. Um, and, you know, as far as historical records pertain, you know, last year we had about, we had a, over a 19% completion rate. So we're pretty similar to there and um, continue to crush the, the, the MOOC average, which is, you know, 5 to 10%. So you know, we're excited. And again, that's why, you know, if people don't feel like they'll be able to complete, that's okay. Um, we care more about the course being a good resource for you. That being said, um, as far as completion pieces, uh, you know, if you get a 75% or better on all of the quizzes, you earn both the statement of accomplishment and the badge for the course. But to get those, um, the statement of accomplishment is a Google form that that module unlocks once you pass all the quizzes. Um, so if you don't see it, that means you haven't taken all the quizzes or perhaps you haven't earned a 75% or better on all of them. Um, but once it is open, you just go into it. It's this Google form that asks your name and the email you want your statement sent to. 
And then similarly, the badge, there's a module for that. You click on that module and by clicking on it, it gives you instructions and on how to access your badge. Um, so just because you ace all the quizzes, there's still a little work for you to, to do. It, it, you won't automatically just get these things pushed to your email. Um, but one of the things that we will do just to make sure is when the course is over, we'll run a check of all the grades and then run a check of all the statements as well as the badges. And if we see any instances of people who have um, should have earned those but maybe didn't click in the right places or fill out the form, uh, we can, we'll follow up with you individually uh, to make sure you get those um, elements as credentials to share. Any questions on that? Okay. So we thought, I mean, for folks who've been through the course, uh, we're, we're definitely not looking to recap the course. We just want to share back with you a little bit of how they were for us. Um, and we're going to have Ben kick that off. Right, so module one, um, some of you, this was eight weeks ago. Some of you, this is this week. Uh, we've just seen some kind of recent uh, uh, posts, which is awesome. We'd love to see continual engagement. Uh, this module was kind of laying the foundation of some of the basic ideas in assessment um, and trying to set an orientation for the rest of the course. Um, I think my general uh, reflections, particularly on the discussion board, is like floored by how many posts were in the introductions. As of today, it looked like there were over 1,100 posts on that discussion board in the introductions. That's phenomenal. Um, and we really do love to see the kind of interaction that I thought in module one was particularly uh, vibrant. And so the interaction between you all on the discussion boards was fantastic. I think that's really what we hope for when we set up those discussion boards. I think some modules lend themselves to that a little bit better than others. And, and I felt like you all did a really phenomenal job at um, you know, interacting with each other on module one discussion board, which is great. Um, and just to reiterate, it's great to see some new faces even this week on module one. So if you're in a situation where um, we're talking to you uh, and this is you, like keep up the great work and know that there's still plenty of time uh, to keep completing these modules as well. Right, so module two, um, module two was the um, kind of, again, overarching introductory material about really kind of getting started, right? The, um, the beginning starts with planning. And so tried to present some structure on how um, you might begin, or if you're doing that, how you might check to see um, if you're doing all of the pieces. So whether you're new to assessment or whether you've um, really got an, you know a nice machine that is um, well oiled. It's an opportunity to look at the, the pieces and do some um, maybe sharpening of different skills. The um, module two is one. It's the first time where the discussion board is divided by institutional type. So I I'm you know I'm sort of always overwhelmed by module one discussion because it's just all these people and they're from all over and you just all these cool things. And then module two um, there's this you know, immediate focus because of those institutional type groups. I did notice that this, um, this time around in particular, there was a, a large group of people who didn't choose an institutional type and they weighed in on kind of the general discussion board. Um, and that was actually the largest group. I went back and looked at um, all of the posts and, you know, it, it's funny because we're assessment people, right? So when, when we get ready to do this live session, you know, we all go back and kind of do some quick assessments and they're, they're not rigorous, but it, it's interesting to go back and look then at, um, at what all happened um, in module two, because in real time, I'm, you know, responding and I'm watching people respond to each other and, and I'm always struck by it. But I went back and did a little, um, just some descriptive statistics, which no one can hold me to because they're really um, very, very rough. But I also, um, I noticed that my personal take that I do in, in module two, um, I hope I didn't set people up because I told people that many, um, many people in the discussion board signal that the, the step that you struggle with the most, that's the, the prompt in that discussion board, if you'll remember, which of those 11 steps tripped you up the most. Um, and in the personal take, I suggest that in the past, we see a lot of um, participants respond that it's step one 
or it's step 10. And I went back and looked at them again and step one and step 10 loom large. And so I feel like now I've set you up and I, you know, I created this thing, but, um, but there were a lot of very interesting responses. So I, I don't think people were just trying to, um, you know, be nice to me. I think people, I'm hopeful that you were thoughtful. Many of the discussion um, comments were very thoughtful. I also found the discussions very streaky. I would go in really regardless of what institutional type I was in, I would, I would go through and I would read all of the large community college prompts all at once. And then I'd stop and I'd take a break and I'd go in and I'd read the small pri you know, private institution under 10,000s. And they, they really do feel different. They, I like using institutional type in this particular discussion board. Um, but it was streaky. One person would say, well, you know, step eight. And then the next person would say, actually step eight. And then two or three prompts later, I get several more step eights. So I'm, I'm wondering how much you kind of influenced your peers as you um, read each other's prompts and thought about it. And um, it was fun to think about. So I don't know if that was cohesion or if that was groupthink. Because of course, right now I'm teaching a teamwork class and we just did this whole session on cohesion and groupthink. So I, it's in the back of my mind. But I will give you a little bit of information. The, um, the steps that were most frequently observed as being the stumbling blocks. Um, the number one was uh, step one, identify the purpose of the assessment, right? But it, it, it featured number one in every single institutional type category, except for one when it was tied with step 10. So the first step is still a huge stumbling block for a lot of folks. Um, step 10, which is determine what will be done with the results, also right up there. In, um, it was tied with number one or it was right up there with number one um, in almost every institutional type. But two other steps were really mentioned more frequently than I've ever seen before. The second step was step eight, which is determine how and who will analyze the results. And then another frequent flyer was step two, which is determine where to obtain information. And I saw those in some ways, um, I was waiting for them to come down along institutional type, maybe smaller institutions had to figure out who will um, analyze the data because they don't have big IR departments and stuff, but it was really all over the board. Lots of different institutions were saying um, who will analyze the data and where to obtain the information were stumbling blocks. And even if you were from a large institution that likely has a lot of people collecting data. So those were my sort of interesting um, insights from the things that you told us about what the stumbling blocks were. And I think that that's just the big takeaway from module two, which is um, you'll stumble and there will be steps along the way where you trip up and that's okay because it's a cycle. It just cycles around. So pick yourself up, brush yourself off, uh, someone earlier mentioned needing wine or needing coffee. I, I strongly consider, you know, um, finding something that uh, you want to drink, whether it's hot tea or iced tea, and just um, stop out and then move on because it really it is about moving forward on those steps, even when you stumble. So that's my takeaway from module two. All right. Did I talk too much? No. You talked just the right amount. And I, I put in the chat, um, in, in light of you bringing up the discussion boards, we don't always get the most feedback on the discussion. So if, if people want to chat um, their thoughts about the fact that modules two, four, and six have those institution specific discussion boards, uh, we'd love to get feedback on that because um, while we think they fit well with those modules, we've hesitated on expanding that approach to all of the discussion boards because we don't know if people would want it for all of the discussion boards or not. So we'd love to hear from you all of if that's more of a useful, uh, beneficial way to engage on the topics. Um, so feel free to chat that in. I'll uh, start talking about module three. You know, one of the things I thought was interesting with this module is at least for me personally, was it was a really good reminder of good practice. <laughs> I found myself as because you know, the discussion board prompt is how would you approach this this new director and how would you give them feedback? Um, you know, just some really great ideas of building relationships, establishing trust, and how to set an example and leverage resources that people were sharing um, that 
was just a refreshing reminder for me as as I'm you know thinking about how I'm working with with new partners on campus and I actually just had one of my team members leave um, so I'm kind of picking up some of their work and re-engaging with people that you know they had relationships with and maybe I didn't um, so it was very refreshing and timely for me to be uh, engaging on that discussion board with people and um, also just useful to um, to encourage people to think about alternative approaches, right? At, you know, for people who their assessment experiences have been very positive, you know, you could tell that their response was um, pretty straightforward and, oh, well, I would just do this and I would just do that. And as opposed to the folks who maybe have had some more difficult people they've <laughs> engaged with on assessment, you know, you could tell their responses. And, and so I think it's really helpful for people to read through and and see that balance and, and think about, you know, especially from this coaching and consulting lens that realizing you have to be ready to uh, adapt to your approach based on what you're getting back from the people you're working with. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a fun module. Awesome. So module four is uh, the module that uh, looks at kind of aligning our assessment projects with broader institutional um, values and priorities like you can see here on the slide and this was the discussion board that you had a choice between two different activities to kind of break down and uh, um, components of a mission statement and write it up together to form like a mission statement out of those components or to build a vision statement out of a similar process answering some separate questions and then building it together into a vision statement um, the lion's share of folks on the discussion board chose the mission statement option and um again interesting you say that emily i'm not sure if that was kind of just momentum on the discussion board or if that was just more interesting to people i don't know um but it, this was also broken up um, by institution and i'd love to hear some feedback if, if you want to drop in the chat or, or just kind of jump in but i i think this was one where i think ideally the institutional separation would really work well because different institutional sizes might have different mission statements or vision statements. But I'm also realizing from the discussion board that I think there's just so much similarity in the world of mission and vision statement writing that I, I got the impression that there might not be as much distinction as I would have expected by institution type. Maybe there should be, I'm not sure, but there was kind of the similarity across a lot of institutions of like, we want to support student success or we want to be valued as like a a, a good institution, you know, and those kind of things. And those are not bad. Those are awesome things. But I'm seeing some kind of similarities across institutions out there. And one of the things that I tried to kind of engage in on the discussion boards with you all was like, can we dig a little deeper into your identity, right? That yes, you absolutely want to support student success, but who are your students? You know, who specifically are you able to support? What What is unique about your student population that is different from maybe the other schools in your region? Uh, and so, uh, being able to cater some of those mission and vision statements to your institution specifically, I think, uh, was a, a common conversation. Um, also had some really innovative things happen where like people took their existing mission statement and then kind of applied the things from the module to see if it held up. And I thought that was fantastic um, because not it wasn't, you know, done in like a, an antagonistic way, but just like seeing, okay, how does our mission statement connect to the content of this module. I thought that was really innovative. Um, and it was also like connected in some conversations to like, even though this was a theoretical uh, discussion board on a MOOC, there's still some political tensions in there in the sense that like, this is a loaded statement that several people have, you know, uh, gathered together to create. And so there was even this theme going through the discussion board of, hey, I already invested in this, or we have already had this approved, so here's my mission statement without any further conversation. You know, it was almost kind of like, hey, this is a little bit touchy. We're, we're not quite able to evaluate this because this has already been approved by people. And so it, trying to separate a little bit of like the theoretical conversation about what makes a good mission statement versus what the practice is of what it looks like in the institution, uh, I think this ties into other ideas about how do you gather together and have collaboration and people on the same page at your institution to build some of these things. Um, but in general, I thought there was really some great ideas uh, in, in that module. Um, still thinking about 
are there ways to improve this, particularly because a number of the responses would do most of the exercise, but not quite all of it. And I think it's just a little bit of a complex prompt, maybe more so than some of the other ones, in a way that I'm wondering if there's any ways we might be able to improve that to encourage kind of the full completion of that. Because a lot of my responses were like, hey, great start. How might you put this together in a, a full mission? You know, I said that quite often. So like, I think we as instructors might do a better job of trying to kind of evaluate, is there something about that prompt that could be improved? So if you do have uh, any feedback for us, please drop it in the chat or also at the, uh, uh, the survey at the end of the course as well for feedback. So Yeah, and um, as I kind of bridge uh, Ben's thoughts on module four here, and um, I probably should have maybe said this with module three of the, the coaching piece, but I just want to get back to Melissa's question. She had asked, like, how do we, you know, what resources might we have of assessing complex constructs such as values? Uh, and so the one thing I would point out um, are AAC and use value rubrics, uh, which actually articulate and, and try and define a number of values uh, and, and complex um, topics that, you know, from a perspective of assessment, you know, with a rubric, you can use it for observation, you can use it to score artifacts or reflections. Um, you can have students self-evaluate, you can have advisors, uh, people that meet with students to, to reflect and, and score students on those pieces. Um, it can also be used in first year experience courses where maybe you assign a, a particular assignment and, and you have this as a component to, to review um, the work that they're doing or the reflection they're having. Um, but there are a lot of ways to as assess those uh, more complex topics. I think you've, and, and the reason why I bring it up with Ben's piece is I think it comes back to your institutional priorities, where you have momentum, where your uh, interventions and services are aligned to some more bigger, broader, heady um, outcomes or goals and values. And when you know that, that can at least help sift through the noise of, well, where should we try and do this? And where should I look to assess this? And so look where it's happening and where you're um, engaging uh, people and, and hoping to instill these outcomes or these values. And that can at least give you a starting point to then think, okay, given this intervention, given the interactions we have with students, what types of assessment might we do? So hopefully that helps as well as the, the resource there to look at for um, rubrics. Um, for module five, and this d builds again off of what Ben was talking about there, um, this one, it, this is a tricky one. And, and I think it's one that um, it's certainly a hot topic in assessment right now because it's it's not necessarily being done as much as it should be. And one of the things that I found myself doing a lot of, and and maybe it's the prompt, and and so I'm going to go back and and look at the prompt and see how um, I can be more explicit in what's being asked uh, of of people. But uh, you know, one of the elements of the prompt was uh, what of the prompt resonates with your mental model. And the intention behind that is, you know, when faced with a situation, what aspects of your identity um, maybe come forward or also what are, you know, what's the first thing that comes in your head? Um, I know for me, having been an assessment consultant in the past and being a, a problem solver, when somebody starts talking to me about something they're dealing with, like I immediately go into problem solving mode as opposed to perhaps sitting back listening and trying to think like what other factors might be at play um and you know one of the things i'm training myself to do a better job of too is thinking of as ben mentioned like you know who are we serving who's making the decisions and you know who's being left out uh in that conversation or whose perspective is not being included both from a decision side as well as a you know an input um data side and so i think people were directly responding to the prompt, um, but not necessarily sharing from their lens what resonated personally with them. Um, and, you know, the point of it isn't for people necessarily to get uh, very open about like their lived experience. It's more to at least acknowledge that your lived experience could very much and does color the way you 
you know, see the world and the way you would react to if somebody sort of talked to you about a, a, a certain topic or an, invited your opinion. And so, I, you know, just the way people, resp a lot of people responded it, um, I, I don't know if they got that. And, and I, I think it, it might just because of the, 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 the language and the way the prompt might be. So that's something I'm going to be looking at a bit more, um, but the, the thing that was really cool is I was very intentional with the language in the prompt in, in putting some things out there that were not defined and that are heard often. Things like, you know, it's uh, for folks uh, that can't remember, it, it's this module, uh, it's this prompt of there's a, a pilot first year experience program that's offered to at risk students uh, and there's some successful outcomes and so they want to expand the pilot. And so a lot of people were saying, well, I don't know how you're defining at risk. And that's such a great question because a lot of times, like if I, if I say at risk to you, I guarantee in your head, there are certain student identities that pop up. But I bet if we had people write those down, that list of identities would look different from person to person. And so it was great to see people calling that out and saying, well, I would need to know more or I'd want to know how we're defining at risk students and who's being included, who's not being included. Um, as well as things such as, you know, we're talking about expanding this pilot and not necessarily saying if that expansion of the pilot would include adjusting the intervention. Cause if, you know, if the intervention was uh, designed for specific student populations, it should have been designed very intentionally for those populations. And so if we're talking about expanding this, uh, intervention to all students, we'd have to change the intervention. We wouldn't just take what was, say, uh, applied to first generation, low income, um, adult students from uh, students of color who um, have you know, had low high school GPAs. We wouldn't take that same model and intervention and just apply it to then all students because hopefully we were trying to be very intentional to the needs of those students. Um, likewise, you know, we have to look at some of the students who are the most at risk aren't in a place to take advantage of resources that could best serve them. And so what does it mean if we're trying to maybe require or push this on them that then they can't even take advantage of it? Um, so there was a lot of good conversation and discussion around those elements, but I think the piece that um, perhaps wasn't as, um, didn't play out as, as I had hoped was that that personal connection and personal articulation of, I see how my worldview um, would impact my approach here. And, and I think that's important to acknowledge because if, if we're not self-aware, then we don't know where our blind spots are. And also then we might not be able to recognize the strengths or potential limitations with, with other people's perspectives to then value having multiple perspectives making a decision. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it, it's, it's always a, a fascinating um, discussion board to dig into, but also time consuming <laughs> because there's, there's some media responses and I'm trying to also, uh, you know, encourage people to, to go a little deeper on the topic. Great. So um, module six, we are talking about using data to inform decision-making the idea of closing the loop. Um, so I'll continue talking about this, but I wanted to uh, return real quick to, module four because um, Jacqueline and Kimberly in the chat have been talking about utilizing mission and vision statements for kind of smaller context within a broader department. And so I just wanted to say, absolutely, I think that's an awesome idea. And also there's another theme in module four about even folks who worked in one person um, offices, you know, maybe they've got one single assessment coordinator and uh, that's kind of the entirety of the assessment uh, unit. Uh, they were talking about how they would build mission statements just for their personal work or, you know, they, they sometimes could use language for the unit, but really it was about when I go into work, what do I, what, what is my mission? What is my vision for my work? And I thought that was really compelling and captivating, not only because it's like connected to institutional priorities, but also uh, the idea of um, 
just understanding like it gives your work purpose. You're able to kind of take some ownership over that and to connect it in with the broader idea. So uh, absolutely, Jacqueline, thanks for the question. Uh, I think that's really great to do uh, regardless of the context, whether you're a one person shop or you've got 20 people on your staff in your unit. So, um, okay, I just wanna address that real quick. So the module six then, this was a really introductory module about here are some kind of basic ideas that you should be aware of in terms of closing the loop, meaning applying the data or your findings from your assessment process to practice. You know, that's really kind of the major purpose of a lot of assessment is to try to improve practice, try to uh, understand how we're serving students and be able to uh, be informed by the data that we collect uh, and analyze in our assessment processes. Um, there's so much that we could do in this module, and certainly I know that people have varying uh, experiences with statistical or data analysis. And so this is probably for those of you who are a little bit newer to this idea, maybe it gave you some good resources moving forward. Um, I got the impression, however, because we changed the discussion uh, topic prompt for this uh, iteration of the course to ask you, it used to be, hey, just ask some general questions about using data, <laughs> which I think we thought would be a little bit more, you know, specific or like lead to certain conversations. I think it just led to some ambiguity. Uh, and so this time we uh, changed it to say, um, can you share a time where either you use data to inform your practices or you wish you could have, or maybe it would have been appropriate to do that. And I was floored by the quality of projects that you all share. Here's some data that I found through this project. Here's how I used it. Here's how they're changing practice in my context. So I was just like, wow, this is incredible. I am hopeful that module six was useful to you all, but based on your discussion prompts, you may be a little further down the line on some of these things than that module offers. And so some of the feedback that, that I've seen is like, maybe can we additionally offer maybe a more intermediate part of that module to kind of, if you're like, okay, I feel good with the introductory, maybe I've even had projects where I've taken data, applied it and closed the loop. Maybe you can have some additional steps of like, hey, you wanna do maybe some inferential statistics. Maybe we can give you some introductions to some of these things. So um, trying to balance like maybe a wide range of uh, experience levels in that module. But in general, super, super excited to see all of the projects there. I think. Uh, there are a lot of folks um, who brought a lot of great experience to the table in that discussion. And I actually, um, I'm so glad that Ben is back because there was a time when Ben stopped out and I had to cover his modules and I almost died in module six. So <laughs> Ben is back and as soon as he got back, he's like, hey, we really need to tweak this. And I said, yes, we do, Ben, I'm glad you're back. So that was, um, that was fun. I'm just reading a comment here that someone says, you know, you're, I love how human you are. So I have to take this moment and then I will race through my module um, because we have been doing this for years now. And in this world of COVID-19, everybody's completely freaked out about relationships. I feel like I know the two of them really well and I've never met them in person. Literally, I've never touched them. I've never hugged them. I've watched them grow up. <laughs> I'm the oldest on the team, if you didn't know. They are having babies. They are, they are changing their lives. They're finishing their PhDs and moving around and getting new jobs. And it's been really fun to, um, to do this. We're this really great example of a virtual team. And it's, it's been exciting um, to do this. We also, I'm the only one of the instructors who wasn't involved in the developer. The, um, Joe and Ben were both involved in the development of the curriculum. And so initially there was this weird like, am I gonna fit in, they're developers, I'm just, I'm an interloper. And we've just formed this really cohesive team that actually um, has worked together and given each other feedback. It's just, it's been really fun. So I'm glad that you see that because I certainly feel it when we, when we do our things together. And, um, and so module seven is, um, it, you know, it's, it's getting uh, from, it, it's getting to talk about culture, which is where you, I think you really create change and move the needle in, in, in assessment in your institution when it's part of your culture. So it's cool that this chapter, that this module happens late in the game. Um, the, the prompt is hysterical. I love the prompt because it, it, it 
you get to go talk to someone else. You get to get all these um, insights and um, campus examples that make sense maybe with the material that you've been reading, or you get to question the material that you've been reading with an expert in you know, the field on a campus you know or don't know. So people do all kinds of different things with the interview um, in module seven and it's great. And I love reading about the insights and I keep thinking, well, you've got a new relationship, you've got a, a, a local expert you can tap now. Um, but my favorite part of the module seven prompt is when people suggest, are there any other components that you would add to the four C's the model that we propose? Um, and I go through and I write them down because I just think it's cool. I actually am part of a, um, another model that uses C's. I was involved as a grad student in the social change model that used C's, the seven C's of leadership development. And so I've spent a lifetime thinking about concepts that you could use to describe with a word that started with the letter C. So this is my favorite part and people always put in um, examples and I listed them all, but I don't have time to read them. Change and curiosity and collegiality and celebration and um, care and consideration and cultural sensitivity, collective collaboration, creative thinking, credit. Um, it was funny this time around, some people came up with F words that they thought needed to be added to the model, like fearlessness, which I suggested courage, because it starts with a C, and follow through and flexible and financial commitment. And so when anyone puts a concept up there, I try to think of a word that we could use that starts with a C, so someone said persistence, and I tried to sell them on continuity. <laughs> so I play this little game in module seven about um, how do we kind of find words that um, represent the concept, because I think it's important when you have a model like that, that a lot of people talked about being able to use the model with their staff or with their supervisor. It's nice when it hangs together like that. It's much more, um, complicated than you think it is because it has these four simple words that start with C, but it, it really has legs. That model really has legs. So I hope you continue to use it and don't be afraid to add your own components in. I suggest you find a word that starts with C, but do whatever you need. I, I enjoyed the, um, the applicability of the comments that came in chapter seven or module seven. It looked like you were really going to, um, move the, needle on your campus about where, um, how assessment was embedded in the work that you do. So good luck to you. Wrapping up, I think I'm supposed to do eight quickly, right? And eight is, um, it's been nice. It's just been this um, ability, you know, opportunity for people to say what was helpful. It seems like a little bit of a love fest. So we're assessment people, which means we are interested in your um, positive experiences and we're also interested you heard all of us ask like we tweak this thing and we want to know what's working and what's not working we agonize over do we keep the institutional type discussion boards do we put them all back together we get together and we we look at the feedback and we pick each other's brains and we um and every time we change it a little bit because we want to keep it fresh and we want to keep it current and we want it to be relevant so I think that module eight is a chance for you to do some celebration of your own success, but I hope you will in fact take the opportunity to give us the concrete examples of things that we could do differently or better, things that maybe could go, um, things that you would like to see added because we will take the time, we hope to do this again and we want to um, be in that very same spirit of continuous improvement. So thank you in advance for your comments on uh, module eight and also in the, um, I don't know what we call it, the end of the uh, end of the experience evaluation. Does yeah. it have a name, Joe? The end, uh, it's, it's called the user experience survey, but it's at the end of the course, yeah. yeah. Um, so I wanna be mindful of time. This is a running joke between us because, <laughs> because when we put these together, we always think, gosh, are we gonna have enough content to fill an hour or is it just gonna be, all Q and A, and then we talk too much. <laughs> so, um, so here's what I propose. Uh, you know, we we some of the things we want to know from you is how you've used the course, um, which is part of the module eight um, prompt anyway. So feel free to throw this in module eight, but happy to chat it in too. Um, and we can share with you too some of our like final thoughts and impressions of the course, but 
certainly want to use these last five minutes uh, for you all to chat in or, or ask any questions. Um, the, the the few questions I want to head off um, in, in case anyone some common questions we get. Um, uh, one is you know students will say, oh you know can I get one more quiz attempt because I you know, I, I passed all the other quizzes, but I didn't quite get 75% on this one. And that's, you know, the only thing standing in my way from getting the statement. Um, we have from the beginning kind of held to this, um, this stance of, you know, no extra quiz attempts, just because, you know, we already give people three attempts for the quiz. Um, you know, the quizzes are pretty low stakes. Uh, and all the answers are, you know, in the videos and, or in the very few readings that that we provide, and um, you know whether you realize it or not, you can open the quiz in another browser. It's not timed, so you can you can have it open in another browser while you watch the video, and just feel like it's this open book aspect. So um, we usually, knowing all of that, um, we we usually try and stick to the the three attempts. Um, as I alluded to the very beginning, uh, the course is accessible after May 10th. May 10th is just the cutoff of when you would last um, be able to take quizzes and get uh, and, and sort of lock those in. But after May 10th, you'll still be able to access the course and see all the information on the discussion boards and see the materials. Um, so don't feel like you have to download and you know absorb everything right now. Um, and the other common question we get is when the course is going to be offered again. The hard answer is uh, <laughs> we don't know. Um, we've, we've offered it once every year, uh, but because it's a partnership between us and uh, between the Student Affairs Assessment Leaders and National Lewis University, there's always a bit of a discussion where we talk to the school and, and share about how this course went, how the timing was, um, if we should offer it at a different time of the year, if we should offer more than one uh, course in a given year because um, we typically just have done it once you know in the late winter early spring time um, so we don't know but um, what I can say is that we always post that information on the open course website which is included right here um, so you can always go there for the most up-to-date information as well as contact Sal uh, to to know um, what 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 the latest might be on the course could I, Joe, could I just ask um, quickly for um, Stephanie from Indian Hills Community College has 10 people on the, um, on this call. If, if you're still here, Stephanie, can you just give, you get one minute to just tell us what you did with all of these people from your institution. Um, how did you use the course and, and um, was it the professional development experience you were hoping it would be? It really was, and I wanna say thank you to all three of you. We actually have um, about 16 people that have been involved in our professional development, all from all across different areas of um, co-curricular and other planning units, admissions, student development, athletics, financial aid, library services, enrollment services, international programs, veterans affairs, those are just some of them. We had previously started this because we had a person who had taken the course last year. She helped those areas get their missions and their goals started. Um, so then we had an HLC visit and kind of got sidelined. So when we came back together this spring, we said, you know, how can we get all of these people to get consistent information about assessment and student affairs and your course popped up and so it was a great way um, for us to combine your resources with our meetings we've been meeting every two weeks and we're going to start having some small individual meetings and they have some great resources now to move forward in planning and assessment Thank you, Stephanie. I just wanted to point out that people can do a lot with this for professional development. So thank you for being our example. I appreciate that. Hey, just in the, I was gonna chat a response to somebody, but it may be applicable to others um, in the closing minute here. Uh, the question was, is there any chance we could like add more people into the course at this time? Uh, because we'd love to help facilitate some of the information from this course, you know, with my team. Um, and while we can't do that right now, um, cause you know, enrollments closed, 
um, you will have access. And so what I would recommend is, well, one, you can download all the materials um, and you know, share the links to the videos, but also like you know, a bit to maybe what Ste like what Stephanie was saying, you know, pull together group meetings where you can just brought, you know, you know, uh, I was going to say broadcast, but, uh, and now I want to say publish display, <laughs> display the, you know, share your monitor and show them the, the course material, but you know, all of it, you can, you know, you know, download, print out, share. Um, so I would encourage that. Um, and then, or, you know, encourage them to sign up the next time we offer it. Uh, so, uh, yeah. yeah. Do you think if I wore my slippers around the house, I would use? Uh, Let me see. And we, yeah, we want to thank Sal and NLU who helped you know, put on the course. Here's our contact information. Um, in addition to you can, you know, folks have emailed us within the course, uh, so you can clearly do that. Um, looking through. Ah, Edie. Um, so you're asking where we can find the re recording. Uh, one, we'll share it out on the Sal listserv, but also in the dis if you click on discussions uh, within the course, there is a live session repository. That's the title of one of the discussion boards. We have the recording to the first um, pre-course live session, and that's where we'll put this recording as well. Um, so that'll be there. Um, so then you'll, so that access is right within the course for that. All right. Well, um, we thank you all so much for uh, being with us. Um, we especially appreciate the feedback and um, I'm seeing a comment right now and what's really cool too, and if this happens to be you in the future, uh, you do let us know. It's so cool that we've had people take the course multiple times. Um, one, because they know we make updates to it or that they took it you know, two years ago and they want to see what it's like now or they, they know that it's a lot of good information, but maybe when they were going through this time, they were really focused on one thing. Um, so feel free to take it again. Uh, and if you do, please let us know and, and share that because we think that's really cool. And, um, and uh, yeah, we, we'd love to hear more about your experience. So thank you all for coming. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll share and post this recording in the course. Um, feel free to reach out to any of us and any other parting words, Emily or Ben? Be safe, be well. Thanks so much for participating, it's been a joy. Yeah, and as, as Ben mentioned, um, since this is week eight, you know, we're, we're most actively kind of engaging in there and you know, the course is open through May 10th. Um, so we'll be uh, kind of going back and as you know, feedback comes on the previous discussion boards, especially for people who like just signed up, we'll be looking to try and engage there, but um, but yeah, engagement overall might taper down a little bit. Don't, so newer folks, don't be discouraged. It's just a lot of people are finishing or are wrapping up or also it's, as you all know, a very busy time. Um, so we'll be around. Um, so if you need anything, please reach out. But thank you, thank you for, for being part of the course. Thank you for showing up today. And uh, yeah, be well, everybody. Bye team. Bye all. <laughs> it's good to see you guys. Yeah, good to see you too. Have a great rest of your week. <laughs>